section of First Corinthians, this, uh, this message Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, what we recognize as, as his first letter. And if I'm going to be having trouble with this mic, then we'll go to this one, okay? Um, you remember, we began the letter with Paul chiding the Corinthians for a party spirit, for one picking this one, one picking that one in terms of preacher, preacher preference, preacher worship. Uh, it was a backhanded way sometimes when they said, I like this preacher. It was a backhanded way of saying, I don't like this one without actually saying it. Paul said, it's not helpful. So it doesn't help the church, doesn't build up the church, doesn't edify the church. They're, they're all just preachers of, uh, that are sent by God, recognize where they come from. Thank God. Take up your issue with God. That's basically what he was saying in 1 Corinthians. So he begins the whole letter dealing with controversies, troubles in the church. And so that's why we styled this study through 1 Corinthians uh, as the perfect gospel. There's nothing lacking in the gospel. When you see people who profess the gospel living otherwise, it's not the fault of the gospel. The fault lies with them. The gospel is perfect. It's a perfect message of a perfect Savior who lived a perfect life and came to save doomed, damned sinners. Well, so the church, the best church, is made up of sinners saved by grace. And so Paul goes through this letter, and he's, he's addressed different things, and we looked more, most recently at the whole issue of of, of the conduct of a woman uh, in, in the assembly, in, in church, how to reflect the order that God has in creation and in redemption. And now he comes, having talked about the Lord's Supper and their abuses there, he talks about abuses related to spiritual gifts. Two terms, and we're going to say this a little bit, two terms pop up for these in this Corinthian period. Let's go with, let's go with this one. Two terms pop up in this material. One, and you're gonna, you'll see it in a few minutes, is the word pneumatica, from the word pneuma for spirit. And one is charismata, from the word charis for grace. And we'll work this. What we're going to do today is we're going we're to read this section, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. We're going to give some preliminary considerations, kind of see how far we get um, in all likelihood plunge into the actual passage uh, next Sunday, but we will see. It depends on how well you listen. Did you know that? That, that the better you listen, the faster I go. You know that's not true. Stand with me if you would uh, and follow along. I hope you found 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 through 11 in your Bibles. I will be uh, reading from the ESV. If you don't have your Bible, we've got it on the screen for you so that you can uh, you can follow along. Remember, well, how long you've been around here, we want to engage the senses in the Word. One of the scariest things I think of, there's two things. Number one is that some professing Christians sit at home all week and never open a Bible. That scares me because it means that what they're getting from the Scriptures when they come here. Another thing that scares me, however, is that people who do actually engage the Word in their homes read to themselves. What that means is that we're never speaking the Bible out loud. And if we don't speak the Bible out loud, then we will not be comfortable sharing the truths of the Bible. So we do this here regularly, engage the senses. Earlier in the service, you're, allowed, you're given the opportunity to speak the scriptures. So you're seeing it, you're speaking it, you're hearing it, it's stirring you up. Here, you can see it, hear it from me as I read it. Let's look at this passage. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. 
There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. If you didn't know anybody, you'd think Paul's trying to make a point about one Spirit, one God, one Father, one Savior, that these gifts flow from the oneness of the triune God, and he gives sovereignly as he will. What we just read, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Thank you. Please be seated. I want to call attention to your bulletin. We have, a, we have a slide that has the bulletin graphic on it. I want it to begin to sink into you now. because This is going to be our bulletin graphic for several weeks, just as when we had the bulletin graphic of the, of the fence surrounding the field, trying to drive home that Christian liberty is bounded by the fence of self-denial. Here I want you to see these things, and what you're going to see is that these are lists of spiritual gifts in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, and 1 Peter. There will be some lessons we can learn from this. But anyone who teaches on, talks about spiritual gifts, the charismata, must recognize that these portions of these are listed in four places in the New Testament. This helps us from riding hobby horses. It helps us to practice what we've taught here. We went through Reformation 500, the 500th celebration of the Reformation back in October. The analogy of faith. Scripture is its own best interpreter of itself. And we're going to be trying to do that as we move through. So keep this focus. Look, if you notice what the list is showing you, and, it, and it's, all it's done here is go through uh, the way that these books appear in the New Testament. No, no order particularly that, that, that creates a, an ascendancy or superiority. Romans gives gift, gifts leadership. Look at this. They are listed alternately. Encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching. It's going back and forth to, to manifestations and heart service. 1 Corinthians 12, where we are right now, and we'll be for, for 12, 13, and 14 for the next several weeks. Administration, discernment, healing, interpretation of tongues, languages, prophecy, wisdom, apostle, faith, helps, knowledge, miracles, teaching. Now notice the footnote at the bottom of this graphic that anything that shows up in italics has been previously mentioned in another list. And so you'll notice for our purposes that prophecy, teaching, both show up in Romans. Then Ephesians 4, which we, we read together. Apostle shows up again. Teaching, prophecy. And then 1 Peter 4, serving, Teaching. Both of those mentioned in 1 Peter 4 are previously mentioned. And so you're going to be seeing this graphic. I want, you to, I want you to look at it. I want you to go home this week and read these passages associated with this. And, and if you haven't done it before, begin to familiarize yourself with spiritual gifts. There's two ditches we want to try to stay out of. One is an ignorance of these things. The church will not be healthy if people are ignorant of the reality of spiritual gifts and those charismata that God has sovereignly given to you as a follower of Jesus Christ. That does not help if you're ignorant of that. The other ditch is to abuse these gifts. This is what Paul is talking to the Corinthians about in 1 Corinthians 12. 
Now, the New Testament depicts two broad types of ministry within local churches. Uh, if you look at Philippians, we're going to look at Philippians 1. He greets that church uh, with the bishops and the deacons. We recognize scripturally that, that there are two uh, biblically taught roles, formal roles in the church. That of bishop or elder or pastor, same, same term or same, same person, different terms, or deacons, the diakonoi, the servants, that's what the word means. Literally means, we've taught this before, to kick up the dust, not in controversy, but kick up the dust in service, to serve, all right? The scripture recognized those, those formal roles. <clears throat> Within that, uh, there are informal functions, uh, and the church moves in a lot of different ways. We have, we have uh, Sunday school Bible study teachers here who teach under the uh, authority and auspices of the pastor. Uh, we, have, uh, we have various teams, we call them, who function together to address different aspects of the ministry and keep it moving. Uh, you have a deacon body that's a, that's a servant-minded group of men. And when you understand what we read in Ephesians 4, the, the best, healthiest churches are those where, where the, the bishops, elders, pastors encourage the facilitating of ministry and not restricting it. Look at Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 just real quickly with me. Again, we read it earlier. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, now here it's not talking about that he gave them something initially. He's going to address that. But he gave them gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers or pastors and teachers. For this purpose, to equip the saints. That's the, that's the warp and woof of the congregation. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. The work of service there. An inactive Christian is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction of terms. My good friend R.F. Gates was fond of saying to people, we would engage in wherever, have you ever been saved? Have you ever, have you ever had an experience that would be like taking a glove that had no hand in it and inserting a hand into that glove so that the glove, which was, which was inanimate and inactive, takes on properties of life? That's what becoming a Christian means. You were dead in trespasses and sins, been made alive, Paul says in Ephesians 2. So for the work of ministry, if you read that, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there ought to be stirred in you immediately, Lord, what would you have me do? Come to your pastor. Pastor, how can I serve? How can I function in ministry in this church? For the building up of the body of Christ. It's never an end in itself. It's never, I, well, I want to have my list of ministries. I did this, I did that, I did. That's not what it's for. It's for building up, for edifying. I want you, when we leave here today, I want you to ask yourself, how have I today, how will I this evening, how will I going forward this week intentionally build up the body of Christ? That's what these things are for. How long do we do it then? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, stated earlier in Ephesians 4, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. So we, we attain unity and maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's our measuring stick? Well, we'd like to think it's so-and-so. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm not perfect, but I'm, a, I'm a more active than... No, no, measure yourself against Jesus Christ. Part of the problem in the church in the West today is too many Lone Ranger Christians. People who have us believe they've been saved, but that's their business and nobody else's. That's an interesting idea. It's a Western phenomenon. Uh, because the folks that we just read about in Nepal, they need one another. They shudder at the thought 
of being isolated as followers of Jesus Christ and cut off from the, from the body of Christ there, no matter how underground they may have to be. Norman didn't say this, but Nepal wasn't even in the top 50 last year. You want to know how bad things have gotten for them and how quickly? How quickly it can turn, brothers and sisters? They didn't make the top 50 last year. They're number 25 this year. They don't think in the rest of the world about my rights, my life. They think about the pronouns used in Scripture. Our. You. And so there's this, this call in the way that God functions in his church. And so that those who minister informally must do, though in, must do so in harmony. If you're disruptive or defiant, you cannot be edifying. You cannot be building up. And the Western church, talking to someone about this the other day, and I said this to, our, to my the fellows I was teaching in Russia several years ago. The Western church is sick unto death because of meism. Me, my, mine. Look for that pronoun, that group of pronouns in the scripture related to your life in Christ. You won't find it. So there's an attitude. And by the way, we're saved by grace through faith. The Holy Spirit comes in us, gives us a new birth, enabling us to repent and believe the gospel. And in, in giving us the new birth, giving us charismata, those, those grace gifts, those spiritual gifts, they tend toward, they lead toward this very harmony and unity and, and building up and edifying and encouraging that Paul's talking about here. So look at me, we're going to do sort of a, an overview of 1 Corinthians 14, 3 to 5. We'll be getting there, but I want you to hear this in the light of some, just some considerations. Paul says, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. What I want you to hear is this building up, this edifying emphasis. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to do what? To excel in building up the church. This question ought to be being asked of us all the time. How am I edifying? How am I building up? How am I encouraging? How am I blessing? But you know what folks in the West do? You know what they say? Well, I'm just not getting blessed. That may be in the book of Second Opinions, but you will not find that in the Scriptures. How am I blessing? How am I edifying? 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for... Why should they be done? Building up. But you won't let me have my ministry. Where is that? 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. Hebrews 13, 17, talking about the dynamic of, of the body of Christ being taught by the people God gives his gifts. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give, have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. We're to grow into maturity. Look at Ephesians 4.16. From, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. Ask yourself the question, what am I, a follower of Jesus Christ, doing according to the, to the will of God, the revealed will of God, as a person saved by grace through faith, to make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love? You see, folks, if we get a hold of what these passages are teaching about the spiritual gifts, there's some things that, some things that we become almost Teflon-proof for. 
One is half-hearted membership. One is divisive attitudes. Because if we really bought into the notion that God would have us as followers of Christ build one another up, then we wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to be around one another to, to practice that. There's particular forms of service, Ephesians 4, 7, and 12. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift to equip the saints, verse 12, for the work of ministry. So we need to learn about these things. We, we need to, one of, the, one of the gifts we're going to talk about is the gift of wisdom. We need to apply these truths, the gift of knowledge. We need to know them to take them in and digest them. This word gift here in, in Ephesians 4, 7 is actually donation. It's not, it's not charismata or pneumatica. It appears in connection with spiritual service only in Ephesians 4, 7, and 8. He gave gifts. He donated to the congregation these gifts the ascended Christ leaves doesn't leave his church comfortless he leaves the Holy Spirit we looked at that and then he gives and in ascending he gives gifts to his, to his churches people called to and equipped for the ministries of apostle prophet evangelist pastor and teacher And through this, Christ bestows ministry roles on every follower of Christ. Look at Romans 12, 4 to 8. It's one of the, one of the passages on your bulletin. And you got, we're reading these things. I hope you're hearing, wait a minute, well, there's, a, there's a real emphasis on oneness here. There's a real emphasis on the work of the Spirit here. There's a real emphasis on building up here. For as in one body, we have many members... And the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. He just, he just goes through this list here. It says here's the attitude that ought to manifest itself in response to the giftedness. I remember when I was in seminary, my evangelism professor, Dr. Oscar Thompson, who died of cancer while I was in seminary, young man, young guy. We were studying this passage one day at the Corinthian passage. And he said, imagine for a moment a believer not being satisfied, being discontent with how God gifts him or her for service in the church. He said, imagine this conversation. God's passing out gifts to the body. So he uses body analogy. He says, I'm going to make you a big toe because the foot needs a big toe to have balance in order for the body to move effectively and the response comes but Lord I was kind of hoping to be an eye and the Lord says but I'm I hear you but I'm determined I'm going to make you a big toe that's necessary for balance and function the Lord I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to be happy if I'm not an I. So in this conversation, my professor said, so the Lord says, okay, you can be an I. You'll spend the rest of your life looking at the inside of a sock. He sovereignly distributes gifts. We've got to learn that and embrace that and rejoice in that. So it's in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
The word here is the word pneumatica. Uh, that's a fancy word, but look at it for a moment. Just look at the word pneuma. If you've ever had pneumonia, you know that it has to do with a disease of one's capacity to breathe. Pneuma is the word for wind or breath. Pneumatica is specifically spiritual things. What you're going to learn when we actually dive into this passage is that it should be read concerning spiritual and then gifts in parenthesis or things, and brothers. So pneumatica is what drives that verse. The idea of things or gifts is supplied by context. That's important. The things of the Spirit concerning how the Spirit works in the congregation, in the body, to, to equip the saints and to build up the body. I do not want you to be uninformed. There's a lot of bad information going on. I told you before through the years here that when I was growing up, for all intent and purposes, I was a functional binatarian. Now, what in the world is a binatarian? Well, you know what a Trinitarian is. Trinitarian believes in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. I was a functional binatarian. Father, I knew about God as Father. Son, I knew about Jesus as Savior. But, but my mom and the climate I grew up in stayed away from teaching on the Holy Spirit. Because in her estimation, there were some folks down the road who seemed to have pretty easy access to a big tent for tent meetings, and, and, and in her mind, abuses went on. I want to go down there one night and see, and she said, you're not going down there. You're not going to do it. Those people act silly. It's not going to happen. So all I knew growing up was folks talked about the Holy Spirit a lot. My mom, godly woman, didn't think they acted right. Well, I had to overcome that. I'm happy to tell you today, I have been for some time, I'm a functional Trinitarian, all right? But there's a lot of misunderstanding. My mother, bless her heart, was raised with a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, the church suffers when evangelical Christians do not address the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He is not an it. When people talk about the Holy Spirit as as some sort of influence, impersonal. If you showed me a picture of your grandbaby and I said, well, now, isn't it cute? You'd be offended. You said, not an it. Now, I realize we live in a very gender-fluid culture, right? But for those of us who are still sane in our thinking, that little baby is either a, either a little boy or a little girl. Was so at birth will be so at death, all right? The Holy Spirit is a person, He. And so we, we're going to learn how to treat the Holy Spirit with the honor and reverence and respect that He is due. To embrace everything He asserts Himself to be, to respond in obedience to everything He works in us to do and to cast off the things that are not his. The people just made up about him. So practice, if you're in a habit, and we all get in habits, of talking about the Holy Spirit, it, just start practicing the Holy Spirit, he. When you speak of the Holy Spirit, he. And think, when you catch yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I would not want anybody to call a picture of my child or my grandchild it. Okay? The pneumatica. I don't want you to be uninformed. So that's, he's telling us why he's writing this passage. Now, when you move on down a couple of verses, I mentioned this earlier, in verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts. The word gift there is charismata. You're familiar with the movement that, that was that surfaced back really in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They're called the charismatic movement. They take the name from this term, charismata. The word charis, if you'll notice, 
It's where we get our word. It's, it's grace. By charis are you saved through faith. By grace. It's God's love shown toward guilty, undeserving sinners. When it's used in this form, it's the idea of, of the graces. Now there are varieties of graces, not, not in terms of varieties of how you can be saved, but varieties of the manifestation of grace. So varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. So there's not just one, there's, there's several. In fact, I, I really believe that this list that we have on your bulletin cover makes you wonder, I'm not going to write a book on this, but it makes you wonder, do we have a comprehensive list of every spiritual gift? They're different. For example... If 1 Corinthians 12 is a comprehensive list of the gifts, why didn't some of the items in Romans 12 show up in 1 Corinthians 12? We've got to consider what God is doing and, and recognize his sovereignty in giving gifts. We're going to talk about, as we get through this study, go about the way some of these have been transformed in the, uh, in the coming into being of the scriptures, which I believe 1 Corinthians 13 references. Now, I want us to nail down some things as we begin to wrap up here today. There are three certainties. There's a lot of people have a lot of questions, but there are three certainties I want to assert concerning spiritual gifts and, and to give credit where credit's due. J.I. Packer, a great theologian, is the one who, who sketched these out. Three things you can nail to the mast. First, a spiritual gift is an ability to express, celebrate, display, and so communicate Christ. That's critical. When I exercise the charismata, one of the charismata birthed in me by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, to whom or what am I calling attention? Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not glorify himself. He will glorify me, Jesus said. So to communicate Christ in a way that builds up and strengthens the faith of other Christians and enlarges the church. Every now and then somebody decides that they're going to be an expert and says, you know, this church is not growing. This church isn't growing. Something's wrong. Well, ask yourself, what am I doing with the spiritual gifts God has given me? Because the scripture says if I'm exercising them, it will lead to the growth of the church, both, both uh, spiritually in terms of development and numerically. That's why I say this is critical, folks. This is critical. Second. So you've got, you got a working definition of spiritual gifts there. Second. Spiritual gifts may be broadly classified as either abilities of speech or of loving, practical helpfulness. So you have these two major, the, we'll look at other classifications and move through this, but two major classifications that have to do with, with an enabling in speech, in communicating, and an enabling of a helpfulness, the gifts of, of helpfulness, loving, practical, in fact, I'm going to suggest to you that these, it's this category of gifts that nurtures and moves the congregation. And I think the devil's deceived a lot of people, thinking, well, if we had a better preacher, and I, I pray one day you'll have a better preacher, okay? So, so, so I'm not the only one praying this, right? But that's not where the Scripture emphasizes it. Loving, practical, helpfulness. And I told you earlier that in Paul's, in Paul's listing in Romans, he bounces between uh, prophecy, teaching, and exhorting, that's which are gifts of speech, and serving, giving, and leading, 
and showing mercy, gifts of helpfulness. And he, and he actually just moves between them. So as to inter, intermingle them. So you don't get caught up in categories of which ones are more significant, whether an eye or a toe. They may differ as forms. All are of equal dignity when one properly uses the gift one has. Look at 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied or variable or variegated grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. The point there, and we'll look into this, is if you're going to say, thus says the Lord, you better be able to anchor it in the word of God somewhere. One of two things. You ever hear anybody say, thus says the Lord? Stop and say, Okay, where's that in Scripture? Well, I don't know. Well, here, here's a pen. Here's my Bible. I'm, I've got a few blank pages back here in the back of my Bible. I need that. The oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. a difference by the way when you serve out of God's strength and you serve out of your strength how do we tell the difference well one of the things is if you're serving out of your strength you're going to get frustrated disappointed and really contentious pretty quick if you're serving out of God's strength you may face the same frustrations and disappointments but you realize you're simply doing what the Lord has called you to do. You're, in other words, you're serving from a different motivational perspective. In order that, in everything, what's the goal? God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I did something, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and this, and this, and this, and nobody paid attention. Nobody thanked me. No, oh, well, that, that's a, I was, gosh, I wish I could have told you that really the whole point of doing that was to see God glorified <laughs> through Jesus Christ. I need to change your perspective. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Third, no Christian is without some gift of ministry. When a person says, well, I just don't have any gifts. Well, I, I, I want to work through the, the humility there that people don't want to write. Well, I'm thankful God gave me all the gifts he did. I don't know what to do with all of them. You don't want that attitude. But, but the other thing is just because what you're saying, well, I don't have any gifts, is I'm not saved. And if you are saved, don't, don't cast aspersion on God's saving power in your life. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So each there means everyone. So it tells us that fact that when the Lord saves you. Now, these gifts may be in the rough. They may not have been cultivated. You, someone may have, may have wounded you along the way, and, and that happens. People, people try with, with zeal. Uh, want to serve the Lord and, and, and bless others, and someone says, yep, cut that out. Don't get so worked up. And it, it can discourage you. Now, now the, if the world tells you that, you know what? You say, amen, I must be doing something right. I've got, I got the world paying attention. But if the church tells you that, have mercy like pouring cold water on a burning ember. But each is given up the manifestation, the, the demonstration of the Spirit. How is the Spirit demonstrated? Through the charismata. How are the pneumatica demonstrated? Through the charismata. For what? For the common good. There's the tension. You don't think people are paying enough attention to your spiritual gift? You're missing it a mile and a half. The question needs to be asked, how, 
How am I growing? How am I being conformed to Jesus Christ in such a way that, that the charismata, the gifts that God birthed in me when he gave me the new birth are being used for the common good of the body, to build up the body in love, to bless. Ephesians 4, 7 says the same thing, but, e but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, wrap this up. It's every believer's responsibility to find, develop, and fully use whatever capacities for service God has given. And I will close by reminding you of the parable of the talents. Jesus talks about the talents being distributed. One receives one, one receives three, one receives five. Then the caretaker of the talents comes back. He says, what have you done with them? One says, look, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to come back. And I didn't want to lose it. Because I've heard how harsh you can be about that. So I buried mine. And I got it right here. Where I left it when you left. And the response is, so you received from me something that was not yours and you buried it because you feared my retribution? You feared what I would say if you lost it? And this is a Bill Askell paraphrase. Guess what? You lost it. Take what was his and give it to another. And you go down, and of course, if you know the story, they took it and, and it multiplied, it added to it, multiplied. Here's the question. I'm going to leave you with this today as we get ready to, get to, to dive into this passage next week, Lord willing. Am I saved? Because if I am, the same spirit who gave me the new birth, who brought me from death to life, who brought me from not loving Jesus to loving Jesus, who enabled me to repent of my sin, begin repenting of my sin, and begin trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished work alone for salvation, that same spirit birthed in me grace gifts, spiritual gifts. What am I doing with them? Am I hiding them? Did I put them somewhere and forgot? Brothers and sisters, there's an accounting coming. There's an accounting coming. What have you done? You'll be asked. I'll be asked. With what I gave you to build up the body for whom my son shed his blood. This study is important. It's very important. Do you know your spiritual gifts? Ignorance of your spiritual gifts will be no excuse on the day of accounting. Have you set aside spiritual gifts that you know in the early days of your being born again? They were stirred up in you. There was a desire there to engage and to manifest, and you've, for various reasons, put them on the shelf. They don't wear out. I could give you something to wear out. What the Holy Spirit gives you when he gives you salvation doesn't wear out. Do I know them? Am I using them? And what can happen in this study as we become aware of the working of God through the charismata in our lives and in this body is things can come alive in you that have been dormant. 
You can see life take on properties in other people's lives. Life in the ministry, life in the body, life in the fellowship, life in prayer meeting. But you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to take a knife and drive it into the heart of this notion that the time you have on this earth is your time. It's not your time. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to become one. You need to trust in him today. Repent of a life of selfishness and self-interest and self-motivation. Trust in him. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that you are bought with a price, you don't belong to yourself. We've already studied that earlier in 1 Corinthians. And you are here. You are breathing this earth's atmosphere to glorify him, to edify one another, to love him, to love others, and to serve. Anyone who professes Jesus Christ who says, I'm not interested in any of those, you've just invited him to take you out now. That's the only reason he's left you and me around. We will learn this. We can be delivered from lethargy. Distraction, wrong thinking, if we will embrace what he's going to teach us in 1 Corinthians 12 through 1 Corinthians 14. And in the middle of all of it, it's one of the most amazing chapters in all the scripture. 